last time we had introduced Herbrand expansions. So, we proposed some statement, it might be true or false, we do not know, but we saw from the examples that something is happening, right. So, given a formula, you find its uh, Herbrand expansions, then say that that formula is satisfiable if and only if the Herbrand expansion is satisfiable, that was our proposal, right. So, for that we need the Herbrand domain or the Herbrand universe, then uh, that generates the Herbrand interpretations, then the Herbrand expansions, okay. So, we started with a formula in SCNF. So, let us skip that, let x be a formula in SCNF. Of course, any formula can be converted to an SCNF preserving satisfiability. So, there is no harm in starting from the SCNF formula itself. If satisfiability is all that we are concerned with. Then you say you find it is Hermann universe, so let us write it as D. Then we have automatically the Hermann interpretation. So, what we had seen is that if you take its Herbrand interpretation, the map along with this, which we are calling as the Herbrand map, should specify the predicates how they are interpreted, should specify the function how they are interpreted. But then here uh, we do not need these functions to be interpreted because the domain or the universe itself are having the terms. So, f is just interpreted as f and any predicate p is also interpreted as p. So, we do not need Herbrand map to specify those things, but we need it to specify whether any atomic formula is true or false. So, that is the specific aim of the Herbrand map with this. So, here this h is equal to an ordered pair d and phi, where phi specifies how this uh, atomic formulas are interpreted either to 1 or to 0, they are either declared true or declared false, some of them can be true, some of them can be false. Then we need also Herbrand expansion, so let H e be its Herbrand expansion. So, we just get the Herbrand expansion from the SCNF x itself by substituting the variables with the elements from D which are not terms generated from the constants appearing in the formula and function symbols appearing in the formula. If no constants is there we start with eta, some symbol we have started with, we start with eta and if no function symbol is there then eta is the only element in our domain D, right. If at least one function symbol is there then the domain D will become infinite, it is denoverable, fine. So, then we wanted to show the satisfiability then x is satisfiable if and now left x has a Herbrand model. If and now left its Herbrand expansion is satisfiable. This was our proposal. Right. Now let us see which ones can be dispensed with easily. Okay, we can start from the beginning. Say X is satisfiable. Then we want to show that X has a Herbrand model. Right. That is really the main part of the proof. All others will be simpler. Okay, let us see the main part first. So suppose X is satisfiable. Now, we can take x to be a sentence, right, because all the free variables are assumed to be universally quantified there. So, it is a sentence, then we need not go to states, we can be at the 
place of interpretation itself. So once x is satisfiable, it will have one model. That is, let i be equal to. We can't use that d. Let's write say a psi be a model of x. So a is some non-empty set. Psi is that map which interprets the predicates, function symbols, and constants in it. Okay, and they will map always to a. A is our domain now. Now we want to show that this has a Hermann model. Okay, so where from we get the Hermann model? In the Hermann model, we have the Hermann interpretation first. That should satisfy. So Hermann interpretation is already determined. D is fixed. Once x is given, D is fixed. Phi is also fixed. In the way it is, how it is giving p and all the predicates and the function symbols. Phi is not fixed only in one sense that which propositional or which uh, atomic formulas it declares to be true, which one it declares to be false. In that sense, only we have some freedom there, otherwise, everything is fixed, right. So, we start with a let h be a Hermann interpretation. So, h equal to let us write d phi, where phi is to be defined, right. Defined for, they will define for atomic formulas. Okay, only for the atomic formulas. And moreover, in those atomic formulas, there is no variable also. Only closed terms can appear there, right? Because that's how this phi will be over this d. D is having only closed terms now. So once you have some p, p of t1 to tn and so on. So all these t1 to tn are closed terms. There is no variable in it, right? So this phi is to be determined only for those formulas. Okay? So you may write atomic formulas without variables. This is to be defined. Fine. So, how do we define? Well, suppose you take any predicate P, say let us say P of ST, a binary predicate where S is a closed term, T is also a closed term. The terms belong to D now because all those terms are only here, nothing else is there. Now, how do you define P S T to be 1 or 0? Well, we will define the same way as it is being interpreted here because we want this to be implied, right? And this we have the freedom of defining it now. So, we will define it such a way that it becomes a model, right? Then it should comply with whatever this I interprets. Is that right? So, let T1 to Tn be terms in D. P be a predicate, P and N are a predicate. So, define phi of P T1 to Tn, let us forget the commas, equal to 1 if and only if. What happens? Psi of we want to connect with our original model. Psi of T1 is defined, psi of Tn is also defined, right? Because they are occurring, all those function symbols are occurring in the formula X. So, if this belongs to psi of P, if there is a complicated formula built up from this kind of predicates, you have connectives and all the other things. So, the connectives are taken care in I the same way as in H also, there is no quantifier. 
right. So, there is really nothing to prove, but then there can be free variables in x ok. So, there only connectives are not there, for connectives there is nothing to prove, only for the free variables we are worried now, in x suppose there is one small x a free variable. So, that means it is universally quantified right, then you may have to do something how it goes over, because in that case it might quite well happen that d is denumerable, but a is not denumerable it is finite right. That is also possible. Then, in that case, many of these d's are collapsing into that a because of this, right. So, structure can be complicated. So, a proof is required only for this case whenever there are free variables in x. If there are no free variables, there is nothing, it is just propositional, fine. So, what we do is, but that is also not difficult. You can see for one step, for example, there is one for each x x, x is a free variable there. So, it is interpreted as for each x x due to our convention. Now, you go for i satisfies this that is given. Now, you want to show that h satisfies it right. Then you go for every element in d this is what happens. Now, if every element in d happens then every element in t also it will happen because all these t's are mapped into the d somewhere right because of size are coming here they are implicitly being mapped to d ok. So, proof should be going that way, but a formal proof will not finish with that we have to start by induction on the number of free variables in x right. So, let us try that directly. So, we prove that h is a model of x by induction on the number of free variables in x call it say new x. So, now if new x equal to 0 it is propositional, so there is nothing to prove basis case is clear. is clear when new x is 0. So, x is simply a proposition right only connectives are there and these are 1. So, connectives will take care in both the things connectives are same. So, in the induction step suppose h becomes a model of x whenever new x is less than n right. So, suppose our x satisfies new x equal to n then x is same as uh, for each x y where new y is less than n right. There is one more free variable in x, so call it small x. Then x is really for each x 1 for each x 2 for each x n then some quantifier free formula. So, first for each x after that whatever remains we call it y right. So, y has number of free variables less than this we are writing this way because each variable in x is universally quantified fine. So, we can write x is same as for each x y ok for some y with new x less than new y less than n. Now, by induction hypothesis hypothesis you get h satisfies y h is a model of y that was we know right. Now, let us see what to do for h. Now, i is a model of x 
right. So, that means for each d in A, okay, uh, we have I satisfies x, x by d. Is that okay? Fine. It is not really formally correct. What we have to do is find one valuation there L, then we have to take L x by d, right? That satisfies this, that is how it looks. Fine. But informally, it this is what happens. Fine. When you substitute that x by d, whatever you get that is satisfied by i, that formula is satisfied by i that is happening. Okay. So, if you write it formally, it will say you have to introduce one l, then put l x by d that way. Fine. Is that okay? If you want that, then you may say uh, take any valuation l under i. Now, you say i l satisfies x, because x is satisfiable. So, I L satisfies X. Then you will be writing for each D and D, I L X fixed to D satisfies X. This out. You have for each X P X. Now, you say I L satisfies this. This happens when for each D in A, I L X to D satisfies what p x not for each x p x right it should satisfy p x. Hmm. So, for that what we do instead of free variables you say universally quantified variables. Okay that will clarify it. Then continue on induction on that, then there is no problem. Okay. That is true, because of the terminology, it becomes the opposite. Hmm. Okay. So, now here what do you do? Suppose I L satisfies for each x p x, which means I L x to d satisfies p x for each d in A. Right. So, here that means it will not be x, it will be y, okay. it should be y, fine. Now, how do we proceed? So, for each d in A, we have this. Now, here i l x to d satisfies y. Okay. Now, this d is an element in A. Fine. So, you can think of some term which is mapped to this d, which term? It is that x, that x has been substituted in our Herbrand expansion by something, some term. Right. So, take that term whichever is mapped, you have a d there. So, you are really substituting that term in y instead of x by d. Right. That is how we can write informally as x by d itself, this is the reason. Is it clear? So, you may say for each, if you write that way, it will become clearer d in a i satisfies x x by d. So, it is really x by t and psi of t equal to d. So, once this is realized, there is nothing to prove after this. Induction hypothesis applies. So, the h satisfies this. Then you say for each d in d, h satisfies this over 24 is taken care. Okay. So, after this, there is nothing in this sense. For each d in d, you will be writing that h satisfies x by d, x by some term t really, right? 
you may say term some term t, t now you can say t belongs to d, now it is formal right. So, once this happens that means h satisfies x ok. So, this, this was the crucial thing in that theorem all others will be easier after this clear. See what you are doing here is you have a and you have d now the whole of d is mapped to a right. So, for each d in a this is happening then for each t in d also the same thing will happen right. See all these terms are given some values in d by i interpretation i right. So, now for each d something is happening. So, that means for each functional value of these t's something is happening ok. So, now for each functional values of these t's this thing is happening hmm. ok. So, therefore, for t also for all t now the crucial idea is you have to see the everything of the Hermann universe is mapped to that domain of the interpretation that is all. So, there is another way of working around it you just define one function mu from the Hermann universe to this domain d then take mu everywhere right work with that mu psi is doing that job. So, once you realize this there is no need of getting another mu right is it clear size so, precisely doing that it is taking all the terms in the Hermann universe to the domain d ok. So, we are simply simply thinking of psi inverse d is here all the psi inverse d may not be single term they can be many, but then for each element also that satisfies. Okay. So, now let us see to the statement we have only proved one thing x is satisfiable then x has a Hermann model ok. Now, if x has a Hermann model then h is satisfiable that we will see how do you show see suppose x has a Hermann model. Now, uh, we want to show that to show its Hermann expansion is satisfiable. Okay. So, what is the meaning of x as a Hermann model? You have the Hermann universe of the terms or the closed terms are there. Now, those closed terms at the predicates when you substitute at the predicates all those closed terms they are declared to be 1 or 0 something is declared that is what happening in the Hermann interpretation itself. So, after knowing that you evaluate x you see that x is satisfied that is what happening that is the meaning of the Hermann model right. Now, in H e what happens instead of evaluating there you are writing it out in urban expansion they are precisely to be 1 what else it can be. If you can see it then there is nothing to prove, huh? but there is still another way of expressing it. See in the propositional logic itself you, you could have discussed that suppose i is one interpretation ok in p l say so, I have i of p equal to 1 i of q equal to 0, i of r equal to 1. Now, I have some formula involving p q r ok. I want to have a model of this assume that this is a model of this right. I can write this model in a different way 
okay so instead of writing i of p equal to 1 i of q equal to 0 i of r equal to 0 i will write it as a set p not q r i can just write this set right i will say that this is my order they are equivalent this is what we have done while constructing the normal forms also right so now what i do i will even forget this q i will say only pr nothing else is right so it means if you look at the formula look at the professional variables there if that professional variable is absent it is negative i can put that convention always right so i may say that this model can be written as pr nothing else okay now in the hermant model this is what happening you are just declaring some of them to be one forget the others they are zeros right so this is the way you are writing the hermant model and hermant expansion is something like this formula okay now you say this is a hermant model of this so that means you go back to this and that satisfies this okay now when you say hermant model is satisfiable you just find out from this one of kind of this is it clear why it is happening okay so is there anything to prove there it is just another way of writing the hermant model that's what it says okay but you have to give the argument the argument will go like this suppose x has a hermann model now you want to show h is satisfiable once it has a hermann model then the formula is satisfied it is inversely quantified so it is satisfied when all the free variables are substituted by the terms from the hermann universe right so their substitution is equivalent to telling all the formula in h are satisfied that's all next if h is satisfiable then x is satisfiable is it clear well this statement is if and only if okay from h also you can go back now then you have to prove only if x has a hermann model then x is satisfiable but there is nothing to prove if it has a hermann model it has a model so it is satisfiable okay so that was only the crucial step first one implies the second okay there is one hitch in this hmm? h is almost proportional satisfiability of h is almost proportional okay let's write why i am telling almost satisfiability of h is almost proportional we will see with the region why this almost huh? let us take one example say x is equal to p x x and not p f of x x and x is equal to f of x okay suppose this is my x now let's go for the hermann expansion so now there is no constant appearing in x fine so dx will be equal to starting from eta but there is a function symbol f which is a unary function symbol so it will generate all the terms from eta taking its composition with f so i would get f of eta f of f of eta and so on all these are there in the hermann domain so then hermann expansion will look like p eta eta and not p f eta eta and eta is equal to f of eta right then p 
eta f eta and not p f of which is named again huh? x has to be f eta now f eta f eta p of f of f eta and f of eta and f of eta is equal to f of f of eta right and it continues it is a denorable set now writing all these x as eta and then f of eta then f of f of eta and so on fine. Now is this satisfiable or not h e h e is satisfiable or not hmm? why it is not satisfiable because of some property of e equal to f eta. Now when you are writing in h e you will not also write eta equal to f eta because equal to is not permissible in the expansion it has to be written as e right. So, you have to really write it as e eta f of eta ok. Similarly, here also you have to write as e f of eta f of f of eta ok. Now, is it visible? It is not satisfiable. Huh? We have to go for the properties of E, right. We know that if E S T is there, then anywhere S is there, you can substitute by T, right. If it is a predicate, truth will be invariant. If it is a function, it is a term, then those terms will be taken as equal, right that is what E means. So, then here what we do is eta f of eta can be substituted for each other. So, I can write here f of eta f of eta I can write this eta as f of eta. So, I get p f of eta f of eta and not p f of eta f right that leads to unsatisfiability is that ok. So, H e is unsatisfiable it should because from the formula itself we can see it is unsatisfiable doing the same thing here x substituted by f of x I get p f of x f of x and not p f of x f of x fine which contradict each other ok. So, this is the meaning of this almost except this equality predicate everywhere it is propositional ok. But then how to make it propositional it can be done there is a way because E is an equivalence relation. So, on the domain itself you find its equivalence classes right instead of domain as D you consider the equivalent classes inside D. So, take one representative from each equivalence class that is your D now ok. So, that then induce one equivalence relation on H e. So, H e will become different right that H e is the Harvard expansion if you have the equality predicate in that H e it becomes propositional now right. So, sometimes in this theorem it is written as H e is propositionally satisfiable that is the sense. So, once you do this equivalence relation or equivalence classes business then you see that H e becomes propositionally satisfiable. So, it amounts to doing something in the proof theory in the proofs. Suppose you have to prove something to be unsatisfiable. So, what you do first apply all the quantifier rules that is what we have done to find out H e ok apply all the quantifier rules finishing it you end up somewhere where you do not need any quantifier rules to be applied further everything after that will be proportional right that is what it says 
So, in any proof system there will be a way to handle it, if quantifier rules are separately given, if not given then you have problem right. So, it says you can have a proof system where quantifier rules are different and you can go on applying quantifier rules, then forget the quantifier rules, you apply only propositional rules then onwards to show unsatisfiability or satisfiability right or even proof for validity, because validity and unsatisfiability will be dual to each other right or satisfiability they are dual to each other. So, it will go that way fine, but there is something else it gives like you have H e is propositionally satisfiable. Now, use the compactness theorem for propositional logic. It says H e is unsatisfiable if and only if it has a finite subset which is unsatisfiable right. So, now H e suppose it is unsatisfiable you get a finite subset which is unsatisfiable. That finite subset would have come from some finite number of formulas in X itself right if you have one formula it is fine, if you have many formulas for that you get the H e okay, by taking their conjunctions. Then you also reach at some finite number of formulas only right, which will be unsatisfiable and that is compactness theorem for first order logic. So, it is very powerful in that sense, it can give you much more, hmm? because you are converting satisfiability of first order logic to propositional satisfiability. So, many of the theorems can be lifted now to first order logic, right? but we will do compactness later in a better way also from the proof theory. Then there is something else, it says something about validity also, right? if unsatisfiability then validity similar way that validity can be propositionally done first applying the quantifier rules then propositional validity. Okay? That is really the Hurwant's theorem we will have some other applications. Suppose, you have a set of formulas now, let us say sigma b equal to x 1, x 2 and so on a set of formulas. Of course, we need one restriction here formulas having a finite number of variables okay, having a finite number of variables. So, this means suppose x 1 uses say some variables, x 2 uses some other variables even with quantified or non quantified whatever it is, x 3 uses some variables if it is infinite it can be potentially infinite number of variables. Right. Now, we are putting a restriction in it that does not happen. Right. So, finally, if you go up to some finite stage you get all the variables beyond that only those variables are repeated right that is what happens here there is only a finite number of variables used in this. Then you can think of a Hurwant expansion of sigma because all that you need is a finite number of variables in the scholarization process if there are infinite number of variables you cannot scholarize finish scholarization right. So, the algorithm will not terminate though scholarization can be done theoretically right, but no algorithm will finish the scholarization process. Now, if there are number of finite variables is uh, number of variables is finite then you can have a scholarization process on it okay. then you can think of H e of sigma. Hurwant expansion of sigma. Similar to each formula, you go on doing it, right? So number of integral functions introduced to be finite because number of variables is finite, right? So the process terminates there for this collimation. Then this one is a countable set, right? Potentially infinite. It can be denumerable if this is denumerable this will also be denumerable at least. Okay. Now, what happens we say that sigma is satisfiable satisfiable if and only if 
ए सी सिग्मा ही सेटिस्फेबल बिकॉज फॉर इच फॉर्मूला यू हैव ए काउंटेबल सेट सो इट्स ए काउंटेबल यूनियन ऑफ काउंटेबल सेट्स नो एज ए पर्टिकुलर केस सपोज यू टेक ए फाइन एट सेट सिग्मा देन ऑटोमेटिकली यूल गेट ए काउंटेबल सेट मैक्सिमम राइट इट इज फाइन एट देन ऑटोमेटिकली यूल गेट लेट अस से ग्रुप थियोरी ग्रुप थियोरी कैन बी एक्सेमेटाइज विथ फोर एक्सीम्स राइट फॉर गेट दबिलियन ग्रुप्स ओनली फोर सो क्लोज नेट ऑफ दैट ऑपरेटर राइट सम ग्रुप ऑपरेटर इज देयर देन यू हैव एसोसिएटिविटी okay then existence of identity element and existence of inverse elements right these are the four axioms so four sentences can be written fine now take those four sentences any model of those four sentences is a group that's what a group means anything that satisfies those four axioms right is a group so every model of those four axioms is a group now fine now what do you do apply this hermans theorem on and of all those four formulas right so you get an urban expansion so now you have a model which is countable right of those four axioms so there is a countable model for those four axioms it says that there is a countable group you don't have to produce huh. you don't have to really produce a countable group it simply says there is a countable group and it is an infinite there is a denumerable group indeed because there is at least one function symbol there used in a group definition of the group so this becomes denumerable right like natural numbers so there is a denumerable group that's what it says fine now let us think about something else say real number system so it has similarly axioms right some 11 axioms right field axioms then completeness axiom okay it is a complete ordered field okay so now all those axioms you add them together you get one big formula x it has many function symbols okay so now go for its servant expansion so you get a countable model for it hmm so there is a countable model for a model for the real numbers also but cantor's theorem says r is uncountable right So what is R there? Anything that satisfies those axioms, then you have a model which is countable. How is it happening? This is called Skolem's paradox. No? There is a problem here. So there are ways of explaining it, but not very satisfactory ones. No? So one best one till now, the explanation is that yes, it is indeed countable, but the function which makes it countable, right? there is a function which makes it countable in the sense that is a map from that place to natural numbers right so that map cannot be constructed within the axioms within the system that map has to come from outside somewhere so that means the cardinality concept itself is system dependent if you have different system cardinality concept will be different right so there are something like you have empty set so empty set can be different it will say because cardinality itself is different so empty set is having zero elements can be different in different contexts okay intuitively it's all right right is say number of uh, people in this room having 11 fingers is empty set but outside it is not empty right there are people having 11 fingers on their hands right so there is some relativization of the concept of cardinality it gives rise to that it doesn't give a paradox it doesn't give a contradiction but relativization of the concept of cardinality itself so there are many non trivial uh, results out of this hermans theorem like this huh? okay let's stop here